Hello, everybody. Welcome to our sound for video session. <laughs> Welcome also, Matt Ruff. Thanks so much for joining us today, Matt. My pleasure. Oh, are you unmuted here? I'm unmuted. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> wrong, wrong, head wrong headphones. <laughs> <laughs> I have to listen to this set of headphones for the intro music and this set to hear you. It's a long story, but great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs> Do you want to tell everybody what happened just before we came on the deal with your internet? Yeah, going? so uh, yeah, so uh, Matt and I were just chatting, and, so, and I was like, getting, I was getting ready to just play the intro music, and I think on your side, Matt, I probably looked like this. Yeah, you were frozen. Yeah, just all frozen, and uh, I went over to my router, and sure enough, the internet had just gone poof. So, um, I'm happy that we're here today. I have all my fingers crossed that we make it through that the internet gremlins steer clear of this, but <laughs> Matt, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you tell us uh, first, I think a lot of the people here know, at least of you, you, you're active in the chat here. You've, you've been coming to the, sense, the sessions for a while, but I want to hear the stories um, spoken. I want to, I want to hear, first of all, how did you even get into to sound in the first place? Where did that all start? Okay, it really is a true story. Um, third or fourth grade, 10 years old approximately, I was in the children's choir at church, mm -hmm. and the choir director, children's choir director, came up to me and says, Matt, your dad's an engineer, and the guy running the sound booth is going to have some surgery, and we need somebody in the back, do you mind helping? He had lots of knobs, looked that fun to me, so I said yes. It wasn't until I met her after college that I found out I was singing loud and bad all the same time, <laughs> and they needed a way to get me out of there, and that's how I ended up in the sound booth. And I've been back there ever since. So it's it's a perfect it's a perfect storm that ended in a happy way, I think, as <laughs> from what I can tell. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I ran sound for the, you know the high school, you know, music productions. I ran at various churches and and fellowship of Christian athletes events, and just I remember showing up at a friend's concert, and their sound guy um, got sick, and I took over halfway. Wow. Okay. Now, it was a small club, you know, nothing fancy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, once you know the basics. You know, you can, everything was set. It was just a matter of, you know, making sure everything stayed on the rails. So, <laughs> okay. That's a, that's a, I think there's our first nugget of wisdom right there. Uh, it's, it's once everything is set. And first of all, getting everything set is, um, oh, that's the work. That's the work. Exactly. And uh, evidently, Mac OS seems to think that I am ha really happy about that and give a thumbs up. I don't know if that came across in the video, but, um, Let's let's actually take a step back. So tell us how how it evolved from there. How did um, your your involvement, especially in live sound, but I think you've also done some studio work as well. Yeah, my studio work has happened once I got to Nashville, which is after basically the turn of the millennium. And I understand all my experience up to that point was mainly church sound. There was some there were uh, some very interesting detours that I was on, but my, because yeah, Curtis, we were talking beforehand, my technical experience was in the, in the field of printing. I was the worldwide, I was the U S director of, of a huge printing company that's no longer in business. And it was all in printing. I ran church sound on, on, um, you know, people like audio buff will appreciate this. Finding somebody who can sub for the full-time audio guy is 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 hard. And yeah. church, when I joined churches, I always would go back and say, "Hey, I know how to run sound. Put me to work." And they always do. They never turn down. <laughs> well, especially when they find out you actually know what you're doing. You know. Yeah. yeah. And I used to have I have a test for when I, I used to I used to be a grandmaster in chess. That's a trivia deal. Mm -hmm. Um. And I used to hate to play people that don't know how to play chess. So I used to have a rule. If I can't beat you in three, five, seven, or nine moves, because there's 
there's really quick checkmates if you don't know how to play that you can check mate somebody in and either three five seven or nine if you make it to ten then we'll reset and we'll actually play and eighty <laughs> percent of the people never make it to ten so that yeah. the, the the trick if somebody knows how to run sound in my book is have them wrap a cable and then throw it and see if it's a knot or if it actually goes and because if you can't wrap a cable you i mean there i met somebody who was a sound engineer who couldn't wrap cables but that's an anomaly yeah. um yeah so i mean that's that's you know that's and that's kind of you know i i w i just ran sound wherever i was um but I, it wasn't my full-time job uh, it sometimes was a part-time job or helping out a friend's band. I was very popular with the, with the, which is funny because I was a clean cut kid. I was very popular with the musicians because I knew how to run sound. You know, so. <laughs> you're their secret guy, their secret weapon that could actually uh, <laughs> run the board when they were up on stage. Yeah, you know it's really funny. Some some small bands, at least in Texas where I grew up, they would try to run it themselves from the stage and mm -hmm. that does doesn't work but not not recommended yeah no i mean yeah. but if that's all you got i mean better than somebody doesn't know what they're doing in the back so yeah okay so tell us uh, let's talk church sound for a while um because uh church sound is not to be dismissed church sound is a big job with um some churches in particular we were talking beforehand but uh, tell us, tell us about, yeah, I guess, tell us about that. Where have you ever, have you done a, a, a stint where you were a full-time sound yeah, person the, the, for a church? Okay. After I, after the printing company went under, mm -hmm. um, what's funny is in their negotiations with people, I just signed a two-year contract in the two-year contract they they set aside money to pay me out for those two years but i had a non-compete so either i could go work for another printing company and then they wouldn't have to pay the money but our church was actually our sister church was about to launch a building program and the sound guy and, and the pastor both all came to me and says matt why don't you go down there and they they just lost their sound guy why don't you go be their um I actually need an it guy as well and i, I actually have all those certifications so I was, you know, a Microsoft server certified guy. And so I set up their exchange server and all the other server stuff. Plus I took on the sound role, but I had a full-time sound guy working for me. So I only had to really run sound when I couldn't get a volunteer or, you know, for a weird, you know, funeral or something like that. So, I, I mean, I did on occasion just so I knew what I was doing, but uh, I rarely had to run sound, but I was director of technologies at a, at a big church in Franklin for seven years. Okay, and Franklin's just in the vicinity. Franklin's there, a suburb Nashville. Of, of, of Nashville. And this is, if you're not in church or Christian music, you won't understand this, but Nashville is home to, of course, country music, which is, of course, a much bigger product. And I know all those guys. I mean, I know, I've been to Brad Paisley's house. I've been to, I mean, I could drop names. I was Alan Jackson's computer tech, even though he, he never used a computer. His daughters needed <laughs> Wi-Fi to work. And anyway, so, uh, but it's also home to Christian music. And so you have the Grammys, which are the, the big audit, you know, awards, but you also have what's called the Dove Awards. And I had a church full of Dove Award winners. I mean, as I was telling you, during our grand opening, we had 17 Grammy and over 200 Dove Awards on stage. I mean, that's how talented our membership was so you couldn't be a bad sound guy there you'd be called out and several touring groups were you know the, the the best of the best christian music everybody from the gospel greats like steve green to jars of clay and and everybody in between michael michael w smith amy grant all those people were a member of christ community at some point in time okay okay so so you really had to know what you're doing there because they're pros. Yep. 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 Okay. So when you're in, in when we're can just to understand the scale of the, the venue, how many seats were there in the house, front of house? Our, our new sanctuary was uh, just under 2000. Okay. Okay. And we're not the, we weren't the biggest by far. I mean, Brentwood Baptist is 6,000, I think. 
Uh, so there were much bigger churches in Nashville than ours. Ours was, our pastor was just very tied into the Christian music scene. Got it. His okay. daughter was married to the six months and then the richer, richer lead singer. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway. So yeah, but, but church is the best place to learn live sound. Let me, let me, that's my opinion. And, and I don't, audio buff can, can, can chime in on the chat if he disagrees, but <laughs> When you go on tour, and I've done a few tours, the venue changes, you, you the the acoustics change, and in and, and a church, you don't have to change once the, once the board is set. Unless somebody else uses it for a special project, most church services are the exact same, relatively speaking. You know, if they're using orchestra, they always use an orchestra. They're always in this position. You most likely have them on the sub. You know, all that's already set, and you really don't have to mess with it. You just have to worry about the solos and, you know, the that kind of stuff. It's a much more limited thing you have to deal with. But, I mean, it's just like any place else. When the sound goes like that, everybody <laughs> turns and looks back at the sound guy, even though it may not be his fault. And I, I, I will say this one, um, and you can Google him. He's a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Steve Green. He's a multi double winning gospel singer. I mean, the man can sing. He's got a great set of chops. I was running sound for him at the church and he, he goes up there. Nothing's coming out yeah. and they go through the intro again and he turns the switch on and he says before the song's on, that was not Matt. That was me. It's the first time it's ever happened in five decades that <laughs> an artist actually took the blame for something. So, um, <laughs> Um, it's a rarity. I mean, if something go if something goes wrong, whether it's your problem or not, they look back at you. So, mm -hmm. in nature of the yep. beast, yeah, that's the thing with sound I've found, and that that applies both for live sound. It applies for video as well. If there is a problem with the sound, um, people will notice that immediately. If there's a problem with visual, you know, the visuals are suboptimal. It'd be like, well, if the content is compelling in some way and the sound is understandable and it's not painful to listen to that's okay you know what i mean it, that that's kind of the, the experience i've experienced when it comes to you know stay or don't stay to watch this content or to listen to this or to you know to experience this production whatever it may be i um, totally agree and, and i think one of the biggest faults on youtube is the reason when i got into having to do YouTube stuff after I retired from live sound because I just got too old and my back couldn't handle. I mean, lifting a lifting a sixty four channel mixer with another guy is still heavy lift, and and yeah. I lost my back got to the point I couldn't do that stuff anymore. And so, um, when, that's a, that's how I found you and others. I mean, uh, um, because I had to learn about a different kind of recording. Okay. And that's, I mean, I took, I'm a fan of, of Curtis Judd. I've, I've made no bones about that because I took your course on how to use the mix free. Now I know how to mix sound and, but it's nice to have somebody who knows how to work you through all the menus and, and it's a reasonable price. I mean, some people like when I was getting into final cut pro editing for the first time, I mean, the prices of courses online are all over the place. I mean, I saw one for 999 bucks and I'm going, that's more than the software times like three, but your price, your pricing is fair. And so I took your course and that's how I found you. That's how, you know, I've been coming to your streams pretty much ever since because you're actually providing a need. I mean, I, I, I know you've heard it before, but, but the Josh Yo from, um, and Gerald undone mm -hmm. bragged about you on their not, not podcast one time, you know, what a treasure you are. And, and you are. So I, I'll take this minute verbally to say you do a very good job because to me, audio is 65, two thirds of video. If the audio is bad, you can't watch the video. If the video is bad, you can still watch the video. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. By the way, I think they called me, a, they called me a tool. <laughs> it wasn't, and that was in context. It sounds out of context. It sounds very funny and, and, derogatory that's not what they meant but it no, they said they were definitely praising you so yeah, yeah. It, the, the anyway that was funny but um <laughs> okay so 
let's let's talk more about church sound when you go on these tours that's i think you're right like if you're in the same venue time and time the program is pretty much the same if it's dialed in you know sitting down at the board is not necessarily that if you've got it working right, it's a beautiful thing because you can sit down and put your fingers on the faders and, and you know what's happening and it's it's a pretty straightforward job. You still have to pay attention um, and unmute when you need to unmute, but <laughs> all good there. But when you're on tour, that's oh, a different, a yeah, yeah, that's a different game. So I'm curious, what is that, um, if you could describe to us one of those experiences, what I'm, I'm really interested in is A, you know, kind of what was the range of different venues you ended up in what was you what, what what was you and your crew like how many people did you have helping you get these set up how much time did you have to get set up for a show my and, yeah go ahead my first tour was unlike any other for buddy's first tour i was in my 20s way under experience for what i got thrown into it's a long story and i really don't want to get into it because it take up the rest of the show but i was at the genesis world tour opening in texas stadium Okay, I was running monitors for that. The guy that it normally was doing it, uh, had appendicitis attack during the rehearsal stage. And so I only had to do that one concert because they're spaced out several weeks apart because it, nobody had attempted those that big a stadium tour before they did it. So that's the biggest venue. And again, I was just one of the cogs. I mean, the sound crew was, I think there was 14 of us. And the guy running it, Michael, who was, was, is brilliant. And, um, I've done work for him off and on through until I retired. Well, he's retired too. So, uh, but he, um, he's, he was one of those, he knew everything and it was great because it's you, whether, whatever your sport is, whatever your venue is, if it's running sound, running a camera, there's always, you want to work with somebody better than you so you can learn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my brother, which is totally off subject, was a professional table tennis player. Okay. Now, I could beat anybody in my high school. In fact, I won this, the, the tournament. And my brother could beat me 21-1, 21-2. So, I mean, it, <laughs> no, and so, but I could, because I play with him, I can mm -hmm. beat everybody else. I mean, that's you get better by playing people better. Well, you get mm -hmm. better at sound by working with people that know what they're doing. Yeah. And the, when I got into studio sound, which is because church members had studios, okay, they, some, I mean, recording studios in Nashville are some of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. We are, I mean, most people don't know the story of where Music City USA got its name, but it got its name from a gospel choir. It did not get its name from country music the gospel choir out of Frisch University were touring Europe and this lady, this, this not lady, this, this queen of one of the European countries they were performing for goes that this must be music city USA. And, and it got back and that's how the nickname, that's how the name started. That's a short version of it, but that's how music city got its name. Interesting. Or you land at Nashville airport. It says music, welcome music city USA. So yeah. Yeah. But there, there are some of the best recording studios around, and that's a totally different animal. But live venue, I mean, you have to have some equipment with you. You have to have a professional, most likely, um, you either have the reference one, or but you have a, a Earthworks EWM50 is what I had. It's a $1,400, $1, you know, mic that you put in the room that tells you where you're starting because that's from there you got to get the eq there are certain places you got to you know you got to get the eq of the room before you can do anything else right and, and just, then just to connect the dots for people who have never done this and that's that's to manage um not only the sound the quality of the sound but also to manage feedback and things like that right because you're getting the, the, yeah, the sound I mean, in the room it just interacts yeah. with the space and it just creates one one thing that most people wow. don't know today, if they're using a roadcaster, it doesn't have a trim. Okay, it has it's digital. You go in there and you know plus and minus. Mm -hmm. What the tr the trim knob, which is generally on I my my comfort is analog boards because that's where I started. Right, mm -hmm. so the very top knob is generally a trim. You set the faders to 
all the way max. And then you turn the trim up until you start hearing fair feedback. And then you cut, you dial it back a little bit. And then, you know, you got full range of your, your faders to do your mixing without hitting feedback. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's why the trim knob exists. It, but people that never been learning sound, you know, they just, they take the, you know, they think the fader is all there is, or the, you know, they put that number in, but that's where it came from. When you're recording, especially with today's technology and mics and computer systems and you know 32-bit float, um, you can't you can't clip things or I you don't have feedback and recording as such. So different ball game. Yeah. But yeah, okay. you, you you had to EQ the room, then you had to set up all the equipment. Okay, plugging in that many cables, you know, they're all generally snakes, you know. Um, uh, and this is a funny thing. We had a, I was again, subbing for somebody that was sick. I'd flown to Louisiana to the Superdome. I think it is in, in, in New Orleans, high humid area. Mm -hmm. They had it all set up. So I was just running it and two channels wouldn't work. Well, they oxidized overnight. You had to unplug them and plug them back in because of the high humidity. You can chase that gremlin. I mean, luckily, because of my one of my big jig, um, my first place of working was Houston, and I was on the sound crew at First Baptist Houston. Every month, we just automatically unplug and plug everything back in because they would oxidize, and you know, it's a it's a weird thing. Cables totally working fine, and it just goes out. Yeah. Oh. And when you're on, you know, when it's time for show, it was showtime. Uh, oof. <laughs> Yeah, the, the big shows, I mean, big shows are in like our, our normal touring, they don't carry a spare soundboard. Okay. Um, and I've I was I was not running sound. I was at a concert when the soundboard went out. And is know. that just the, was that just the end of the concert then? Surprisingly, no. Okay. It happened to be the 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 there was a guy there whose church was literally like two doors down from the event and they went and grabbed the, he was a sound engineer. They grabbed his soundboard and brought it over to the concert hall and plugged it all in and resumed the concert. <laughs> so there was an intermission, a sizable inter- intermission. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me ask this question because this is a challenge I think for many of us today. And that is, um, how do you find, a mentor. So for example, you were at the Genesis tour, you're running monitors. How did you establish the relationship such that they said, Hey, Matt, can you help us out here? Actually, I was just in the right place at the right time. And that's a long story. This is, I don't okay. want to get into, but the bottom line is I, I mean, again, you go into any church mm-hmm. and, and I know, I know Mark from the channels here and others, if you go into almost any church, whether you're a member of the church or not and say, Hey, I'd like to learn sounds and the sound, they will put you to work. I, okay. I mean, I don't know too many places that, that have excess people. I mean, in our class, we were one of the exceptions. Somebody wanted to come run a uh, mix for us. We'd say, go someplace. So we, we've got touring pros that are, that are our s- subs. Yeah. I don't really need anybody. And, and, you want help, I will make phone calls for you. And, you know, there are plenty of smaller churches that need the help. Yeah. So yeah. But church yeah. is a good place to do because you still got to learn to wrap cables. And the other thing is, and, and this was interesting. I, I, I don't know if you watched, I think you mentioned you watched um, Audio Buffs church little backstage thing they did. Very, really great video. I hope you can't put a link up, but it's a, uh, I watched it and I was shocked because he used a way of mocking his piano that I've never done before. I'm a, I'm a snob when it comes to mics. I will just mention that. I mean, <laughs> after you put a earthworks piano, it's about a $3,000 mic set up on a mm-hmm. piano. Nothing sounds, nothing sounds better. And to, to me, the piano in most church services is the most important thing. Oh, I do have a caveat. I do do not run sound. I never took a job or I never attended a church that had a strong pipe organ because those suckers would totally <laughs> mess up any sound system there is. So if you had a huge organ, no, I, I'm not an organ fan. 
So okay, okay. I mean, all right, they're terrible, but I mean, <laughs> I, some people love them. <laughs> it's it's a yeah, it's a it's a instrumentation choice that um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. We do have a, a couple questions that have come up here. Here's one from Christopher: um, How often would you recommend or record the live shows, and what were you doing it for? Were you just recording from the board? Joko, a computer with a DAW. How did you do that? For the, I was at, I was, I was just a guess. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Um, it, it, the best concert I've ever attended in my life. I'm not on the crew. Okay. I just want to state that. But the Michael, who's, who was an extraordinary sound engineer studio guy uh, in London was in charge of the Prince's All-Star Trust Concerts. Hmm. Now, imagine, we all know great British singers, right? You've got, of course, the Beatles and you've got um, Queen. And imagine the best of the best. I mean, mm -hmm. at the time when Dire Straits released their super hit, um, they it was like that next year. They were the special guests for this one segment of, of this concert it went all the, it went all day long okay it started at like 10 with various artists but the, the, the premium guys you had eric clapton on guitar you had elton john on piano you had phil collins on drums okay this was the best of the best and those concerts were amazing so um but the those type things the, the ability to tie all that together when you've got in in a short period of time because it's the royal albert hall which is a heavily booked venue they have to set all that up fairly quickly that's a talent i don't have okay luckily when i got thrown into it it was already set i just had to not mess it up because i actually knew how to run them i had this that boards are you think learning how to run a uh, uh but for recording they they had a they were live to, I think they were live at the BBC for that concert. All those signals were split, isolated at the sender. So a mixing console for, for the BBC was in a room separate from the live sound. I've never, ever recorded for anybody professionally other than just an amateur, you know, a small group um, off the main board. Everything was a separate board because it's totally different. The church, one of the big churches, we had our own television program. Those were isolated. We would patch down a special from, from the sound booth. We'd give them a patch to a, their mics. But other than that, we had nothing to do with them because they were running a stereo mix and live sound. I mean, some people say it's left, right, center and all that. But it's really just mono in a lot of ways is because you got to, all the people in the room, they got to hear the stuff. And if you do a you can't do stereo except for the sound booth. Okay. That's, that's where it's stereo and everything else would be off. So <laughs> most things yeah. are, is truly just a mono mix. Really? Yeah. There is some yeah. stereo, but. Okay. Um, let's see here. Another question here, uh, back to the, to the EQ at the start of the room. So how, what's the workflow for, uh, EQing an empty room versus a room filled with people? Uh, Again, there's a, the guy that I taught me had a formula for what you plug in for what the people brought to the room. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and he had a, basically a mylar piece of paper you'd put over the computer screen and you would adjust to the mylar and then that would get you in the ballpark. Got it. How you did it. I mean, the people that did it from scratch again, that was above my pay grade. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not afraid to say that. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm not the best sounding guy out there. I, I know that. Um, I never was because I was never formally trained. I just learned it as I went. Yeah. I mixed I, by what I heard. Exactly. And I, I did it just to, to Linda's question, what I, what I have in the, in the limited experience I have with live sound, um, I was helping out with a, a concert. It was in a, in a track, believe it or not, they had a, it's in Wyoming. There's a train roundhouse that they restored recently. So the roundhouse is where they would bring the locomotives up and then the, it, the, there would be a turntable that would turn it and then they could pull into a bay where they could work on the train. Um, so that's what the roundhouse was. 
and um or work on the locomotive and so they had restored it and it now was a music venue so it's all concrete floors Oof. glass glass windows um uh, like wall windows um extraordinarily uh reverberant space and i remember doing the sound check i uh, helping out with the sound check and i was like <laughs> This is a disaster because we got the they brought the band in and it was a traditional Irish uh, music group. So they had pipes and they had, um, you know, strings and so on and so forth. But we put them up on stage. We got them all mic'd up. They they start playing and the ringing out that room took a solid thirty minutes of work, um, just because the there there was so much. But then once. You know the, the engineer was also telling me by the way curtis just so you know it once you fill this room up with people the the dynamic completely changes um that you know you're not going to have as many problems with feedback then as well just because you wouldn't have as many you know you'd have all the salt the salt water bags as we call them <laughs> all the salt water bags would be sitting in seats and uh changing that dynamic but there is definitely i think a change that happens once you get a room full of people versus an empty room that you're just uh doing the, the initial sound check at in some of those venues at least other than that, I think outdoor venues are the hardest ah, because okay. because weather affects things. And, yep. you know, I remember it was raining all day long and we had a tent over us, but we were standing in water. Oh, my. <laughs> I mean, we brought in some pads and stuff. Oh, that's another thing. If you're a traveling sound guy, mm -hmm. you buy the best, the most expensive, the best fatigue pad you can because your legs will appreciate it later yeah you're doing a lot of sitting a lot of, a lot of standing yeah, those those, those oh, pads oh, you stand oh the ones on. you stand on yeah. got it yes. okay yeah I definitely got have one of those i i uh, see i don't i can't i can't run sound stand sitting down i can do it in the studio but in, in a in a in a live venue you're standing the whole concert got it got it because you gotta you probably have to move around a bit more too those are big consoles too usually well, right? some of them, yeah the, the, the most of the channel once most of the ones i use were 64 channels analog now the digital yeah. boards have gotten i mean you can get digital but they're much smaller but to me they're much slower okay they're great okay at our church we we had a rule we had a, we because it was such a high quality venue mm -hmm. that they would there'd be a full practice sound check on saturday and that the room was not available for anything else because of that, the the board was set and the stage was set for the show. I mean, for the for the service, which is somewhat unfortunately was the show too. To be quite honest, mm -hmm. all these artists were, you know, they think it was their time to get their next record deal. That, that was a problem <laughs> in our church, big time. These people trying to get on the the not my side on the music director, you know, side of getting yeah. to do the solo in front of you know record producers and studio execs and that kind of stuff. But what what is it about digital boards from your perspective that makes them slower? I'm curious because I because I have I have some reservations about digital boards too. An analog board, a all the channels are the same. Okay, it's you've got you got the fader, you've got your aux sends and that kind of stuff. The bigger the board, the more of those you have, but it's still all in the same place. Your EQs are just all right there. You don't have to go press a button to get to it. Um, mm -hmm. now you don't have the advantage of pressing a button and resetting everything instantly either. So yep. though, though that came in with some of the bigger analog boards, you could store. They motorized. Yeah. motorized. yeah. You could yeah. store settings. So that was great. Um, um, I, uh, I was brought in to run sound because they fired their sound engineer and they were looking for another one. And the guy knew me and he says, can you run these two concerts? And it was just a, it was a Friday and a, and a Sunday and it was a Christian group. And because it was, and he, he knew he could call my, the senior pastor who would say, yes, Matt can go do that kind of thing. So I just said, yes, save, save everybody a lot of work. <laughs> the sound guy wasn't very Christian. Let's put it that way. He he reset the board to zeros, oh. and and he did a few other things. He he switched the left and rights and a few other things. I I had to look for gremlins everywhere. So little challenge. That was, that was not a, that was a challenge. Luckily, I had time, and I had a really 
and I, I reason I know all that, his first assistant stayed on the job and he wasn't yet good enough to, to run. He told me he's, he sort of made mental notes of what the guy did. And he, we, und, he did undo most of them yeah. and I got him the gig. I thought he was actually good enough. Yeah. Um, and so. Okay. I, that, that's an interesting thing. And I think that's something that we don't think about a lot of times in today's world in 2023 or 20, oh, sorry, it's 2024 now. Um, <laughs> get your day, your years right. Um, it's, it's always exciting to see a, you know, something that has a lot of features and we're, you know, we're wowed by, oh, look, this single device, I can do all these different things. I can do so much stuff. And that's true. But when you have to switch between them, when you have to use your phone to operate something or a tablet to operate something or, um, oh, yeah, I can't or your stand. computer, your computer I mean, that, to operate it, something. It, I mean, the mix pre, you, you've got to do it all by this one knob. Okay. Versus, yeah, yeah. you know, having a separate knob. I mean, the roadcaster is an amazing piece of tool. I mean, I know the Mackie as well, but the roadcaster was the one that did it first, right? They're, they own the market in that regard. That's amazing for what you can do in that tool is amazing. I mean, you know, we have fans, you know, people go, Oh, it's too expensive. I go, I mean, let me rack up some, all the DBXs and stuff. And you want to talk expensive. Well, yeah. You know, but yeah, no, just, I, it's amazing what you can do today with this stuff. It's, and the yeah. kids don't know how easy they have it in some ways. I mean, yeah. I mean, digital, you know, these, you run two ethernet cables versus running, you know, 500 pounds of snake. <laughs> you know. Yes. Yeah. It, everyone should have the opportunity, in my opinion, to run a snake for a show just so that they can experience what that's like and, and how, how the world has changed so much now today. Yep. But, you know, as a sound guy, back to the touring thing, there was a whole bunch of things you had to have. You always carried real gaff tape. You always carried batteries. You always carried... Um, two identical set of headphones in case, you know, something happened. You got to have a Sharpie with white electrical tape because you got to write every, you know, what, what channels are doing. You got to have all that down. You got to have DI, bot. you got to have gender switcher in case you, I mean, there's a 16 channel snake going to stage and then the 17th, but you're not using all the speaker ones. So you can gender change those on both ends and make it work. Okay. Um, one of the, one of the guys I didn't know personally, but, I mean, I met him in a couple of venues that Michael introduced me to. Um, he he had the belief that you could run any show, period, any show, any big tour with just two types, two mics. I mean, lots of them, but just an oh, SM57, oh, yeah. SM58. He said that covers everything. And, and he's not probably wrong. I mean, if you have a stand-up piano, an F F fifty seven right on the hole is, is will give you a really good sound. Okay, it's it's not a bad mic choice. You put it on the amp, it's a good. I mean, it's you. I always traveled with a pair of fifty sevens and, and a fifty eight just in case. Okay, those they're and and there are all these knockoffs and they want you. And I there are shows there are YouTube shows that you know that always buy this, the mic, the Chinese mic on Amazon and give it a test. The difference is between a professional mic, like a Shure, Sennheiser, AKGs, I mean, Newman's are, you know, priced out of the, the, the ballpark, but an Earthworks, an Earthworks mic, you can buy 20 of them and you, and you take them in a, in a perfect, one of these sound studios and they'll be all the same. You buy 20 of the, the Chinese thing and they're all over the place. You may get a good one. Mm -hmm. One of the best guitarists in the world is a guy named Phil Keggy. He's a Christian artist here. And in, in fact, he lives two miles from me. Um, there's a quote. It's ascribed that Rick, uh, Jimmy Henry says, was it feel like to be the best guitarist? He goes, I wouldn't know. Ask Phil Keggy. That's how good Phil Keggy is. Look him up online. He, his, his ability, and he's got a finger missing too, to play guitar is just, I mean, he's at a level that's just above everybody else. Okay, that's true with everything. But having the right mic on the guitar and having, I mean, not all guitars are the same. I mean, there's a reason Gibson's cost so much. Okay, but he found, he, he found this knockoff, 
cheap guitar. He says it's his third best guitar. It just happened that they got everything right in that one guitar. The rest <laughs> of the guitars are junk, but there's this no name brand guitar. He says it's just a, it just happened to, to turn out to be brilliant. Just got lucky. You know, I have a lot of work with NASCAR, and and they for years we had what's called international. Um, what was it? It wasn't NASCAR. It was a separate deal where they put everybody in in equally, supposedly equal cars but everybody would would soon find out that the yellow car was about two miles on it you know slightly faster because not all engines are the same even though they're all the same specs yeah and, and that's true with with even high-end gear but i know it, <laughs> there's a studio it's one i've worked in he's got a newman that he keeps locked up he says it's the best of the best mm -hmm. it's just it's perfectly flat it gives perfect recordings. And he only uses it, you know, when Bono comes in town and that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> All good. Okay. A couple more questions here. Uh, Grant says, how do, how do you recommend sound engineers and voiceover artists prepare themselves for generative AI technologies, both using as tools and as competition, uh, you know, seeing them as competition? What are your thoughts there? AI is this, you know, I have, I, I don't spend a lot of time with AI. I can't get Siri to work right for me most of the time. So I, I, I don't have a lot of faith in AI's ability to problem solve. Okay. The, the difference between a computer doing something and you and me doing something is we have the ability when, when the, like when the internet crashes, you're toast, but in live sound, you you can still run the thing. Okay. But they can't talk. So the, the person is still valuable to, I mean, I can't imagine a, a robot mixing sound. I, the, that's to me a long ways away. But then again, have you seen that robot playing badminton? Mm -hmm. I mean, but you know, it's taken years and years of programming to get to that good. So, but yeah. Again, I don't have to worry about it. I'm 64 and retired. I, it's, you know, <laughs> my problems aren't with that, but, <laughs> um, I, but I still think the, the personal the ability to, you know, our, our ability to, to fix things and, and to, to Southern, what, what, it used to be another word where now we call it Southern engineer things, the ability to, when something doesn't work to come up with a solution that isn't sort of traditional. I mean, that's one of my strengths. It was always been one of my strengths, uh, but having the ability to, I mean, there, there are no necessarily i mean how you mic a drum kit okay i can bring i can bring engineers on and say well you put you put the ak you know a which mics to use where that's a whole argument i i, I actually enjoy those arguments do you put the the drum inside on a pillow do you put it right at the at the hole just inside the hole just outside the hole i mean it, everybody's got their own way of doing it mm -hmm. And yeah. you, you can compensate for stuff. Um, you can't compensate for a bad mic. Okay. That that's, that's why I don't skimp there. I only buy name brand mics. When I sold my mic collection, it was, it was, it was a serious chunk of change. Um, <laughs> Cause I had 20 earthwork mics. I had, I sold all but two of my Sennheiser. I sold all my S and 58s and, and the, earthworks equivalents and and you know because if you buy as you want to you buy an akg you buy a 416 and, and i i would say probably the dpa is probably for videoing production maybe a better choice um i just i have out of 416 because in the sound world that's what we use mm -hmm. those mics are 10 years old and, and they're you keep them in cases and, and they work just as good as you buy one off the shelf it's not, you know, it's not a something that gets old like some things. The other thing is is learn how to solder, okay? Make your own, at least you need to know how to solder because you may have to repair something, but, you know, get good cables. I mean, I don't ever, I mean, I would say I haven't ever bought, but I don't, excuse me, I don't buy cables off Amazon. Hmm. I mean... I don't know he's here today, but 
your friend, the boom operator, uh, Alan. Uh, Alan, yep. If you can get him to make, I had him make some cables for an install, and they're excellent cables. So I can brag and say those are good. But yep, yeah. Amazon Basics, with no disrespect to Amazon, Amazon Basics XLR cables. Um, I've had emails come in from various people. I have a buzzing sound in my. I have a hum. How do I get rid of it? <laughs> and usually, it's a live stream setup. And they have Amazon Basics cables running back with all of their power adapters and, you know, behind the desk. So it's a, it's a nice tidy setup, but they're running the cables right next to their AC adapters and everything else. And they, they aren't very well shielded and they, they pick up all sorts of noise. So you, you learn some of this stuff, at least in my case, I learned it all in the computer world back when we had the huge dishwashers. We put the hard drives in that were 300 megabytes. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, those... They sort of had this shielding you would have to wrap around everything, the entire distance back to the computer system, you know, then you always, you, you had computer floors and you had tracks for those computer floors and the power would only go, would go one way and the data would go the other. Things are a lot easier today, but even on tours, the power and the, the audio cables are separated. Yep. For good reason. Yep. But if you're not taught that, how would you know? Exactly. Hey, it's a cable. It should be. It's got an insulator around it. it should be fine, right? Mm-hmm. What you can't see is the you know the RF stuff. Yep, or the electromagnetic fields that they generate mm-hmm. around those power cables, for sure. All right, uh, Audio Buff says, talk about your time with Fox and NASCAR. I, I guess yeah, there's I think a story I, I, there. Well, there is. But see, I was Daryl Waltrip's personal tech. I did his, he couldn't barely operate a phone, okay? So, I mean, I, I, kept, I kept his computers running. He was big on, when he got a Twitter account, which is a huge story, something I'd love to tell, because um, he it was like, you know, perfect for him. But I met, because he was Daryl Walter, he was in charge. He was the guy that the, the head of Fox Sports brought in and he picked all the rest of the people, to be quite honest. And then they brought in the Fox Sports people, technical people. I mentioned to him that, you know, hey, I'm a sound video guy. So if you ever have an emergency, put me in because I'm not doing anything when Daryl's on the on the, the show. And sure enough, that happened. That's a, I've run sound for, I ran a camera once and I ran sound twice because somebody got sick. Uh, there was a flu epidemic in Daytona when we were the biggest show is the Daytona 500 and the poor guys, you know, there's no way he's going to run sound. He can't get out of the bathroom. Okay. So, um, I got the, Daryl goes, it's, you know, so-and-so, I don't want to mention his name. He goes, because you weren't joking. Can you really run sound? I go, yeah. He goes, he goes, get to the, have Daryl's, you know, we had little, you know, golf cart, drive you over to the you know it's a, it's a truck it's a semi truck that's a you know wall of monitors and soundboards there and the guy had enough break to show me where he had everything marked and and i ran sound and, and the only thing i was really scared about because the, the guys commentary that's it's not that complicated a mix but they do this thing called uh crank it up where they don't talk and they, we bring up the, the mics that they've run around the track. That's the part I was scared about, but he, t- he, he, uh, he had enough breaks to when that was coming to kind of make sure I did it right. Yeah, it was, I did it a couple times and then I ran a camera. I don't, I don't want one of the cameras that are way up on, you know, the, the, the arms. So I don't really like heights all that much. Um, but, uh, I ran the camera cause I, I flew it to make, and you know, Fox is, of course, a huge company. They do the, you know, they've got baseball. They've gotten so they they were getting people to Daytona, but they were still short. So I could fill in on a camera. Those are I mean, those Fuji non lenses on the ends of the camera. That those are, I mean, they're of course they're like hundred thousand dollars a pop. Yeah, they're great lenses. <laughs> I made the deal asking how much one of these suckers cost because they're just really great. You can zoom all the way in, all the way. Out. I mean, you talk about a throw. It was great. You had the the little grips with the zoom control yep. and yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but see, our again, a church I worked at. 
volunteering, Travis Avenue Baptist Church, way back in the day. It's in Fort Worth. It's right next to the Dallas, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the, Bab the Southern Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth. And it's also where the Baptists had their own network at one time called the Axe Network. Well, all the Axe Network guys, we were the, we were the Sunday service on the Axe Network. And so we had a, you know, a million dollar uh, studio and with all of the, you know, the big, big old one inch tape, you know, the, the huge cameras and all that stuff. <laughs> and the technical board is there, those old school technical boards, they're so scary looking. I mean, now you can do it on the little ATMs like you have and, and do the Zach's and at a much higher quality level. But back then, you know, it's a different ball game. But yeah. we were the, we were the, and so again, I had great teachers. The, how, how, how does one get a good teacher in 2024? I get, I think you've, you've tried, you've actually alluded to this multiple times. Go to a church, go volunteer. To a church, volunteer. Yep. Um, go to a, venue, I, go to a small music venue and volunteer. You can offer. Nah, I wouldn't know. Nah, no, nah, nah, that could cause, that could be. You, that could be messy. That could be messy. Yeah. Um, where's another? I mean, there's got to be other streams besides yours that are more into that area. That, but you know, I've. I don't know. If I should say this. I won't mention the guy's name. A guy contacted me from all the comments I've been on your channel. Who's moved to Nashville and he's doing and said, Hey, you want to have coffee? He's looking for some help on something. So I said, yeah, I mean, I'll meet you for coffee. I'm, I'm retired. I, I can, I'll help you out. So, I mean, I, I don't think there's a lack of people. I mean, I just know church sound guys. I mean, I, I've never met Jude from audio buff. Okay. But I guarantee you, if you walked into his church and said, Hey, I'd like to learn sound, he'd put you to work. Uh, I, I, I don't know the guy down in at any of the big churches, but I, none of them turned down people really wanting to learn how to run. I mean, it's, it's no different than at, in the NASCAR days, you know, the, they, most of the crews were volunteers, you know, they just wanted to work on, you know, Daryl's crew or <laughs> Earnhardt. I mean, if you're Earnhardt, you probably had pros, but you know, back in the day, it, it's, I mean, that's true with, my son wanted to get into construction mm -hmm. and luckily he was helping out at a, at a, on a mission strip, you know, building a, a daycare in, in South Africa. And, and the guy goes, you really want to learn how to do this. And the, he hired him and, and trained him. Yeah. It's all, I mean, I don't care what the, it's good helps always hard to find. So if you if, willingness to work is, the number one requirement in most anything. And I personally believe I can do almost anything. You just give me enough time and energy. my brain, you know, can wrap around it, you know. No, I can't design a rocket with Elon Musk, but I, you know, other than stuff like that, I can, I think I can dive. I'll, I will say yes, I will try technically to help anybody because it's all the same stuff. Yeah. Here's, um, Here's here's a just a really quickly we're coming up to the end here but Billy has a question here maybe recording a concert in a church in the next couple of weeks if there is a board I can take a feed to my mix pre 10 2 do I take it as a line in and or do I need a DI uh Oh Curtis Rose again Um so oh, wait. Oh, there you're back. Good. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> um, That's the question. Yeah, I mean, most depending, most boards will have a a stereo out. You can take right into the mix pre, uh, or you or you could go through a pair of DIs XLR in that way. But I think you'd be better off doing the most boards have a have a RCA out. Yep, or they have, or in, in many of the new digital boards have a. Oh um, yeah, built in. Stuff, don't they? Yeah, they'll just take a line. Yeah, they can give you. A, I mean, they've got my SQ five yeah. has got like sixteen outs, and I can just I can just route. You know, they can even give you a custom mix if you want. They can say, you know what, you can get a custom mix with no EQ or anything like all the EQ we've done for the for the house here. You can just have a raw feed. 
So I only got a few minutes. Remember my first the sound the sound box in the, the the Methodist Church back when I was ten. It didn't have faders. It just had knobs. It's one of those PV. It was the amp, the mixer, everything in one kind of thing. You only had six channels too. <laughs> you know, you, you only had low, middle, mid, and high. Yeah, I think it did have one aux in a mono aux in. I think it had one, and then it had a trim and, and it had the level. That was it. You know, you really couldn't mess it up. I don't know why anybody needed to actually run it to be quite honest. <laughs> but I was ten. I didn't smart enough to figure that out. <laughs> It's all yeah, there's Mark. Mark made that post because I was telling you, and they had 200, close to 200 media group volunteers that is at their church. Wow. Wow. Uh, wow. That is, uh, that's a different, that's a different scale here. But, but there, <laughs> I mean, um, I'm not a fan of the man. I've met him multiple times. Joel Stein used to be his dad's director of technology. Most people don't know that. So they have, the best equipment i mean they have sony top of the line equipment they don't they don't spare it a cent i mean it yeah, is yeah. really nice gear and some there's some churches mega churches that have unbelievable equipment yeah 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 well matt thank you so much we're we're at the top of the hour here i wanted to say thank you uh for coming on we i feel like we barely scratched the surface i think there are a million stories that we didn't get to <laughs> i would love to do one with jude as well the three of us and talk about mike mike's per, i think there's a huge need what mike do you put on what piece of equipment we didn't get into that at all except for yeah. skimming the surface that to me i think is a, it would be a good topic okay I'm game for that. I'm game for that. Uh, I'm hopefully sure he is, Jude, Jude, I think would probably be willing to talk about that. All right, friends. Uh, thank you all so much for everyone that joined here today. Apologies. I had some in and out internet issues here. Um, I know there were a few outages. Hopefully everything is, uh, We hopefully it was still worth your time. I think it was. Thank you, Matt, so much for bringing and sharing your, your experience and your knowledge. That was a blast. I mean, yeah. who doesn't ever want to go down memory lane every once in a while? <laughs> okay. All right, everybody, get out there and make some great sound this week. We will talk to you again soon. Take care. <laughs>